Hi, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Aussie Roll Call Podcast. This episode is a little bit different from our regular format as this is our PAX wrap-up episode. In this episode, you will hear one of our hosts, Dan, who did not attend PAX because he was too busy exploring Europe, interview both Kate and myself about our PAX experiences. Sprinkled in amongst the main interview, you will also hear Vox Pops. These Vox Pops were recorded at PAX live on the show floor, so the sound quality is going to reflect that quite a bit. We hope that you will be patient with us as we still find our footing in terms of recording live audio, and hope that you'll enjoy the Vox Pops no matter what. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome to the ARC Podcast. I am Dan, I am here with Kate and Stevie. I just want to talk about their experience at PAX because I, I missed out this year. Starting with Kate, Kate was at, I believe, seven panels. And uh, how, yes. I guess, how does that feel? How, what did you find? And what panels did you yourself go to as well outside of that? Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in panel land at PAX. So for those who don't know, PAX kind of has, there's the like expo floor where you've got exhibitors. You've also got the tabletop area, which is where Stevie spent a lot of their time. And you've got panels off in the theatres and other spaces around the, the con. When we talked to Kitty about like the setup of PAX, we talked about the Albert Theatre, which was the actual play theatre this year. And I was in three different actual plays, one on each of the three days of PAX. One for That's How We Roll as our one-shot revolver, where people got to pick which game and what theme and what the big bad was. And then we played, in the end, Magical Kitties Save the Day. And I played in the two actual plays that I normally play in. Dungeons and Doctorates, we did a kobold caper, so it was like a blend of D&D and Blades in the Dark. And then we played some straight 5e for the Meeples and Dragons um, actual play for some Feywild fun times. Uh, And then I was on four other panels, uh, all TTRPG related, because you can't stop me. I ran Cradle Kiss the Monster Manual, or sorry, Cradle Kiss 2 Monster Boogaloo, the sequel to Cradle Kiss the Monster Manual, which was not for children, let's say that much. <laughs> uh, very not for children. And then uh, on the Saturday, I did both uh, Dimension 20 Rate the Greats. So we talked about all the different Dimension 20 seasons uh, and what made them good or not so good. And then I was on a panel called Yes and Why Every TTRPG Player Should Take an Improv Class. Uh, which was myself and a bunch of other improvisers talking about the things you can get out of an improv class that works with what is an improvised storytelling situation. Uh, and then on the final day, we did Melvin Mind Slapper's Cursed D&D Trivia because, you know, second year in a row, good good, good times with that. It was, it was a big weekend for me, I'm not going to lie. Seven was a lot. <laughs> Seven was – we just calculated before we started recording that I did – what, like eight and a half hours in just the panels, like on panels? Contrary to popular belief, people who play TTRPGs can count. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we might I, be slow, but we can do it. We just can do it. Time. Yeah. I also love so how you them as yeah. sequels. Yeah. So, well, Crit or Kiss we did last year. And it was mostly the same panel. I had one one change of player, of like a panelist. And it was a format that works really well. I'm tossing up pitching it for a couple of other conventions in the future, but maybe video gaming it a little bit more than TTRPGing it, but we'll we'll see. And then Melvin Mind Slappers. I think, I mean, the benefit this year was it was D&D's 50th anniversary, right? So, you know, you had a lot of options. And I think Albert Theatre also gave us a lot of options for different actual plays. Um, I saw a few other panels as well, because I was out doing... Vox Pops, um, which you'll hear throughout this episode as well, uh, with different people. But there was panels from everything from, so Zach Speaks Giant did his D&D, but every role is for real. So like, if you're going to do a strength check, you kind of got to do the strength check. Me me and my family saw that as well. It's something we saw last year that was a hit. So we went back again this year, which was a lot of fun. Uh, One of my favorites, it was the first thing on Friday morning, which was um, D&D Death Roulette which is basically they're all going to die and it's for charity and people get to kill off all the players and they rotate through and it's glorious, glorious chaos. So I love that one a lot. And then you've got other like more serious panels as well, world building related and different things. So it's good times. One thing I've always found struggled with panels is finding the ones to find. Or like, the, like, cause there's so many, right? Like you've got so many per day. How do you find them? How, how do you rate them? How do you kind of work out which ones you want to go to? In that uh, to, to repeat Kitty, uh, the PAX app, 
Yeah. The Pax app. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I, I do use the Pax app a lot, but I, I mean, I guess I'm unfairly advantaged in that I know a lot of people who do panels at Pax. And so I tend to be like, who's doing what guys? Like when we all talk to each other to kind of know what's on and unfortunately what clashes with each other. So I would have really liked to say drop in on um, the spicy Baldur's Gate panel, uh, but it was running at the same time as an actual play that I was in and, and things like that. So that does happen. Clashes will happen. Um, you just have to pick. Yeah, one thing I found with, like, the PAX app is, like, it's great for panels, but, like, if you're trying to decide, like, between playing a TTRPG, which, you know, they take up two hours, they're not listed individually inside the PAX app, so it's kind of hard to, like, line those up. Um, You kind of need to, like, use an external calendar for that sort of thing, which complicates stuff. So, Kate, I saw the Criticus to Electric Boogaloo. Um, How do you come up with those... So for those of you who don't know, the uh, <laughs> this panel, Kate creates these amazing dating profiles for these monsters. Uh, the audience gets to rate whether they would smooch said monster or try to attack said monster. Um, what is the process? What is the creative process, Kate, that you go through with crafting these absolutely amazing uh, profiles for these monsters? <laughs> these these absolutely cursed profiles. I mean, I am very lucky that I, so I'm a trained improviser, which um, I think everyone kind of knows. Um, so saying weird things in weird ways is one of my favorite things to do. And I luck out a lot that um, one of my beautiful, beautiful friends who touch wood, we are going to interview on this very podcast in the not too distant future is one of the editors of the Forgotten Realms wiki. So I get to very occasionally be like, hey, I don't have enough information about this monster. Do you know anything more about this monster (laughs) that I can write about? And then it's mostly just coming up with weird ways of saying the obvious thing. So the first year we ran it, we did one for a beholder and I finished it with just beauty is in the eye of the beholder because it's right there. (laughs) Sometimes the sentence (laughs) is just in front of you, right? There are puns in D&D. Oh, yeah. So many. So good. This year's one was harder because I was trying to make it as good as last year's, which was so stressful. But I think... Look, if you talk to any person who's trying to write the second book in a trilogy, it, the second book is the hardest because, yeah. like, you're trying to hold up with the, so the first. Hard. And there's that, all so that hard. pressure. It's, yeah. Yeah, I was really, really nervous that we when, that it was not going to be as good. But it did go well, which is great. But yeah, I think for me, it's very much, I also think about who I've got on that panel, which I think is such an important thing to do if you are going to pitch panels for something like PAX, is who is on your panel? What are they bringing to the table? And how can you make them have a good time? So I have a lovely panelist who has done the last two who will basically say yes to everything. So I have to find red flags to throw into the descriptions so that they don't just say yes. They have to be like, oh, I don't know, and then say yes, because that's the fun part, right? The fun part is the, the, you just don't, you're like, oh, but, oh, but should I, oh, that's, but it's a this. Last year, I think the one that was was interesting for everybody was the Aboleth, which got a very graphic description that I will not repeat on this podcast, just in case there's any small humans listening. It, it has teeth. It is roughly the same shape as a uh, sausage. It, it was, yeah, it was, it was very much like one of those, okay, you're going to have fun with this. So like, let's let you play with it, but let's let the audience go. Absolutely not. That's terrifying. But I think that's true across all the panels is you want to have fun on a panel and you also, as an audience member, want to see people having fun, right? There's nothing worse than going to a panel and being like, everyone is really boring. So I think that's that. And it was really fun this year. There was a lot of really interesting panels. Um, there's a couple I didn't get to that I really wanted to um, because clashes happen. Like there's always panels about uh, mental health and panels about gender in gaming and trans representation in, in the gaming spaces and um, unfortunately I had a lot of clash panels or crossover panels, so I didn't make some of those, but all the creators who were on panels this year really did have some interesting stuff to say. And a lot of those panels were very full this year, which was wild, uh, for those of us who were expecting very small audiences because of clashes. And we were like, oh, there's still lots of people here. Hello. Uh, how are you? I hope you're having a good PAX. But yeah, I think panel land is fun. All right, I'm here with Nathan from Arkenforge. Uh, Nathan, yeah. what is your favorite snack to have at the gaming table? Oh, great question. I always love chips. It's annoying a bit because like they crunch, but it's still just very satisfying. I'm not big on nuts, which is usually what people go for. 
So I think, yeah, chips are probably the next best alternative. Something like chocolate, you're going to get sticky fingers and whatnot. So, yeah, a nice clean chip is what I go for. Wonderful. And what is your favorite dice? It can be either shape or set. I'm a big fan of the liquid core ones these days because you get, like, the nice little glittery swirling thing inside, which I really like. So, yeah. Awesome. And what is your favorite tabletop game to introduce new players to? So we've actually just started a Legend of the Five Rings 5th edition campaign, and that's been really fun to introduce people to. So that's my favorite system, and it's... Yeah, really fun to sort of... It's just so different from D&D. So it's very etiquette, social-based and whatnot. So, yeah, it's a very fun one to introduce people to who are have done D&D before but are looking for something different. Awesome. And what is your tabletop must-have? What do you have to have at the, day, at the gaming table? Oh, for me, I have to have a digital screen. <laughs> um, ideally running Arkenford. But, yeah, I find that... Using digital tools at the table to really boost the immersion is something that I always do with my games, whether it be a battle map on a TV with some animated maps going on or some audio that's running just to really set the scene. So I did a really good Call of Cthulhu game with like just ambient audio and just really freaked players out just from how heightened that immersion was. And if you could have like a companion animal or a robot or a familiar, what would it be? Um, oh, great question. I think in one of my games, I have a red panda as a familiar, and I think one of them in real life would be wonderful. <laughs> they're, just, they're very cute, very mischievous, and very disarming, I think. They'd sneak up on you and just slice you open. So, yeah, have you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nathan. No, thank you. Do you have any tips for somebody who might be wanting to pitch panels at either PAX or other cons in the future, just like maybe one or two extra points that we haven't already covered? Uh, know, your, know what your format is. Know what you are actually bringing to the table. And I'd say this about an actual play. I would say this about a podcast. Like we talked about what this podcast was before we ever like committed to doing it. And I think the big trick is like Crit or Kiss got up the first year and we were really surprised we were all like okay cool cool but it was very clear as to what it was who it was for deliberately targeted to not just be for a very niche audience deliberately targeted to be for a lot of people inclusive like diverse panel lots of perspectives in a weird way the panel I'm least likely to go to is for people who are best friends talking about the thing they love because you're all bringing the same perspective and I kind of don't need it after the first one of you's talked in a lovely way. Like I would be vastly more interested to say have, I don't know, um, four different TTRPG writers on a panel who don't know each other with a moderator who can bring them together to be let, to find the things that are in common about their world building or about their their perspective on writing characters, especially if it's around gender or race or, you know, classes and things like that. I think it's it's very much more interesting to blend your panel. Um, and that's reflected in what Kitty said, really. And have a catchy dumb name, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> that's the other one. Like, as much honestly, as people say don't judge a book by its cover, I believe we all do judge a panel by its name. Absolutely. There, there are panels that I know would have been fascinating and I'm like, I just know they didn't get the audience that they should have because the panel name didn't jump off the page at you. I know that Critokis the Monster Manual got us up because it's what it's called. Like everyone's like, oh, I know exactly what that panel's going to be, right? Same with a Kobold Caper for Dungeons and Doctorates, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to an actual play that is a bunch of people playing Kobolds who are on some sort of capery, interesting, fun, shenanigan-filled adventure it's like yep that's that's what you got i just think those kinds of things really do help is knowing what you're going into um, it makes it easier to run too knowing what your format is makes it easier for you to run as well and on the other side of, of packs we had stevie in tabletop land um stevie how, how was that what did you find what did you play what did you run yeah i was kind of not exclusively in the tabletop section i was kind of like across both the expo hall tabletop and i was also up in sort of like not only the the panels but also um the packs together lounge um on the friday i ran the um melbourne queer ttrpg meetup in the packs together lounge and i ran three different games i ran um a lyric game by logan timmons which is high name i'm dad also i ran um the there's a game by Lucien Impala, which is like a murder mystery game, but you all play detectives who are solving this murder mystery using like the chatterbox. If anyone remembers from high school, like having those chatterboxes um, and sort of it acts like a little Oracle thing. And like, you all sort of like tell this story by passing the chatterbox around and like 
improvising what the uh, the murder is and who did it and why kind of thing. And my own game, which is Fates Less Known, which is about a person coming to a fortune teller to receive information about their potential love interest. And it's like this, you go to see like a fortune teller and like it's using tarot and the fortune teller uses the major arcana to be like, hey, this is the situation you're in. How do you respond? And the person going is like the seeker and they draw the minor arcana and they draw two cards and they total it up. And it's like, it's either a full success, a um, mixed success or a failure. Um, and that will detect, d- dictate how the story goes. So it's a duet game, but it's a romance game. So I ran those. I had people playing. I only bought three sets of tarot with me, and I had three concurrent games going, which was amazing. I was like, I should have bought more tarot, but tarot were not cheap to buy. No, they're not. No. <laughs> but that was really cool to see how other people um, play that because it was kind of also a semi-playtest environment as well. That was amazing, and that was like only one hour on Friday. (laughs) On the Saturday, I got to play a game called Guild Chronicles Death Side Tales, and it's in the playtest phase at the moment. And it is, you play as a receptionist at a guild, you get to design the guild, you get to use cards to describe who's coming up to like the front desk and like what they look like and what their disposition is, and then you like journal about it. And so basically you're like creating like this log as this, guild receptionist about you know who's coming in and what's going on in the guild and like my initial guild was like I started with it was called the Sirens Loft which is like a last minute bard hiring service in a fantasy realm so like if you've got an event going on you don't have entertainment you go to the Sirens Loft to hire (laughs) your last minute bard sometimes they're amazing sometimes they're really shit sometimes they don't show up at all (laughs) (laughs) It was really fun to try and like weave different stories together. I wrote so many pages to the point where the designer and the facilitator was like, are you okay? You're writing a novel over there. I'm like, (laughs) you have given me the perfect tool for like world building. I am going to eat up. Like I am so into this. You do not understand. So that was amazing. Um, And then Sunday I got to like, just like sort of chill and just like wander around and look at things and you know, just, just like be a participant and an observer. And that was really fun. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, do you have any tips for people who want to come down to the TTRBG section? Cause they get booked so crazy quickly. Um, you got D and D tables, Call of Cthulhu tables, Pathfinder tables, and then the, the indie tables, I guess we can call them uh, run by arc. What would you say to people who want to kind of get in there maybe for the first time? What, what should they bring if anything? And, um, and I guess, where to start? That is such a good question. Um, So in previous years, I've definitely, like I've done different sort of like runs of packs. Like I've done sort of like full on, I'm going to go to every panel I possibly can packs. I've done the, I'm going to play as many TTRPG versions of packs that I can. And like having done the, like uh, play as many TTRPGs as I can version of packs, doing that particular run, um, I'm making it sound like a video game because it, bas- <laughs> it basically is. Who are we kidding? Going to the sign up desks early and booking yourself in for what you want to play throughout the day. Um, and this kind of comes into like my main gripe about packs is like the app is amazing, but it doesn't accommodate for the TTRPG schedule. Like you can say, the TTRPGs are running all day, but like they're, they're two hour time slots. And if you're trying to like work out if you're going to go to this panel or play this game, you can't make that decision in the app because it's not offered to you. So, yeah, um, at the moment, as it stands, going in, booking in early, being aware of what's on offer, joining the ARC Discord will definitely give you a massive leg up because a lot of the information is posted ahead of time in the um, Australian Roleplay Community Discord and, and sort of like managing it that way. Generally, you will need to bring like water, dice, a writing implement, um, depending on the types of games that you're playing and the kinds of levels of your game masters because I found that game masters who are used to running, so like the games of um, things like Call of Cthulhu that I've played at PAX, um, they will have everything that you need to play like you don't even need to bring dice like the the game master is there with that whereas some of the people who might be play testing their games or they might be slightly newer gms who um are just sort of like getting their foot in the door if you have those things already to hand you are ahead of the game you're just making their lives a little bit easier so 
those would be my And if name. you don't have them, you can buy them because the expo floor exists. If you don't have them, you can buy them. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Um, I was go- I was going to suggest bringing tarot cards, but that might be a very niche item. <laughs> Look, I use them in my game. I don't know, like, and, and obviously they're not that uncommon, but dice are definitely a more common randomization yeah. item than tarot. My my very friend's true. advice was to take take a uh, set of eleven. So the ones that have like 4D4s in them, I saw 4D6 in them, just because there are so many games that are D6 system, and you're going to want the extra D6s basically that is so true i've actually seen that on i can't remember if it's on like x threads or in discord but i've seen people say yeah the only game i played required 3d6 and it meant that i didn't get to use like all of my dice or the the one set of dice that i bought so yeah bringing the 11 set if you've got them or being Mm. aware that that is probably going to be it's useful yeah it's almost like that's why the d6 is my favorite dice according to our fast five dice (laughs) Hey, that's a callback. I was going to say as well, uh, I, I guess from my own experience, not this year, not this year, but in previous years, is kind of go for the indie games because it's really easy to join a and d table. It's not as easy, but still a lot easier to join a Pathfinder or, or Call of Cthulhu table. But it, it's kind of hard to find a Fragged Empire table or one of the other, like one of Stevie's games, one of those kind of indie games that you're you, you just can't find them anywhere else other than packs or the other cons. So mm. that is definitely one of my main pieces of advice going into like cons is that like they are not super accessible on a lot of levels. And I think we can all agree like sensory wise and on a bunch of other accessibility factors, they're not super accessible. But if you're able to get into them, they offer you the chance to try a lot of games with very low buy-in. So you can try a game of like Fragged or some other indie game like Guild Chronicles, for example, without having to buy it, without having to find a table of people, without having to schedule it. Like all of those big, I guess, uh, roadblocks that might be in your way to finding a game to play in a con setting kind of get erased. Like if you can sign up for that game, you will probably have other players to play with. You will have a GM. You will have someone who can walk you through the system. You don't need to buy it. You don't need to GM it. You don't need to find anyone else to to play it with you. All of those other logistics are sorted out. So I personally think cons are the absolutely perfect way to try other systems, to try new things. Like particularly cons that have those two hour time slots like PAX, it's a really good amount of time to get like the general vibe of a game to get some of the basic mechanics down and without having that that awkwardness of like I've wasted half a day at this con on this thing that I'm not enjoying. Um, I do think two-hour games are perfect. I know that they are sometimes hard to make for certain systems, but I know that they're easy to schedule. But yeah, that that would I, I do agree with you, Dan. Like, definitely trying those indie games in that setting is the best way to sort of like dip your toe in with very low commitment. And I guess it's worth pointing out as well. Most of the time, if you are going to those indie games, you're not just having a GM. You're probably having the game's creator or publisher yeah. running the game for you as well. So you, you're getting that kind of almost the best possible uh, game that you can get with that particular system. Oh, for sure. Now, I guess on that note, do you guys have any like highlights that you'd like to bring up about PAX? What was your favorite thing? I had some really lovely conversations with, um, and you'll hear them in the the Vox Pops that I did with some of the expo, like the exhibition exhibitors. So I had a great chat with the guys at um, Ravens Bridge uh, Rev- Emporium and with the guys from Fragged. <laughs> It is Sunday of PAX Australia, and I am here at the Ravens Ridge Emporium with Jesse. How are you doing? How is your PAX going? PAX is amazing. It's like being a kid in a candy store, and you want, like, one of everything, and you try not to touch everything. <laughs> so true. Not me going to every booth. All right, I've got our fast five questions for you. Yes. Uh, my first one, most important, what's your snack of choice? Okay, I don't know if everyone's going to agree with this, but definitely hummus and crackers. Okay. I, it's mostly hummus and tiny bit of cracker because I just pile it on. The like, crack is the vehicle. Yeah, yeah the crack is the vehicle. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, I always ask about dice, but I'm going to be nice. You can have a dice shape and a dice set. Okay. okay. I think my favorite dice shape would have to be the D4 because, mm-hmm. like, 
not only is it used for like healing, you can also use it to hurt someone. So it's like double edged sword. Double edged sword. <laughs> and my favorite dice shape, um, oh, also that I said, yeah. is anything with cellophane in the middle, the big glow, mm-hmm. it immediately grabs my bird brain. And I'm like, I need this. A little sparkly, <laughs> I love it. You've got a brand new player that have never played a TTRPG before. What are you playing with them? What, what do you want them to play with you? I feel like Shameless Promote, we've got a game called Cartograph, um, and it's super rules wide, really easy to play, and it helps you world build. So you sit down with a player, you walk them through how to create a character, and together you like build a map of the world and create an entire world that you can then use to play D&D with. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been eyeing off Cartograph all week. <laughs> um, all right, so you've got dice. You've got your snacks. What yeah. else do you have to have at the TTRPG table here with you? What's your extra thing? Oh, the extra thing is definitely props. Mm-hmm. Like the table has to have props, like the metal go- 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 goblets. 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 Yep. Candles, mood lighting. It can't be the bright fluorescence. you got to dull that right down. Yeah. Yeah. Bring, bring everyone into the story. Uh, I'm with it. I'm music with it. in the background is always lovely, too. Um, and the last thing, everyone wants a little companion guy, like like a little robot or a little animal, like a D&D familiar. What's your little guy? Who's your oh, little guy? I bet the Ravens in the Mario, so it's got to be the Raven, right? Just a little bird. Perfect. <laughs> no, no, it's well, I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. It is chaos here, and I don't want to pull you away from the table for too long, but I'm going to keep eyeing off Cartograph. Yeah, sort of bit. All right, it's Kate, and I am down here at Pax Australia. Oh, my God, it's the end of day one, but I am here with Wade from Fragged Empire. How's your day been, Wade? How's it going? Very good. Very, very good. You never know how Friday's going to go, but today was good. It's been good, I think. It's been the right level of busy, from what I'm saying. All right, well, I've got my fast five for you, so we've talked a little bit about it. Let's do it. What is your favorite snack to have at the TTRPG gaming table? Corn chips. I know they're messy, but they're basically catnip to me. There have been worse answers, so I will tell you that absolutely. (laughs) What about, um, you've got dice, right? So what, what's your favorite dice shape? Are you a, a D6 I or D20? I have D6 all the way. D6 all the way? My yeah. people. D6. Yep. Do you have a favorite set? A 3D6. 3D6? I love my bell curve. Mm. I love my bell curve. Mm. It's so nice. Yeah. Love it. Um, what about your favorite tabletop game to introduce brand new, never played a TTRPG before players to? Well, I have to, I have to screw my own one here. But yeah. I, I would go with my ragtag. Mm-hmm. Real slide, vibe heavy. Very make a character in no time, have fun. Very, yeah, love that. Um, all right, you've got dice, you've got snacks, both important. What's your other tabletop must have? What do you have to have at your, uh, your no, gaming table? Notepad. Simple, classic notepad, and you write every, you write all the players' names, all the player character names, you get little notes like that's yeah, thousand percent. All right, last one, important. If you could have a companion animal, like a familiar in D&D, but we're not playing D&D. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's your little familiar? What's your little guy? Oh, uh, man. I, I, I'm torn to, like, the classic little mini dragon, yeah. although I'd probably end up regretting that in the fire. <laughs> so I think something small and fuzzy. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but it's something small and fuzzy, I think. Yeah, small, fuzzy, adorable. Something I can hug and, yeah. Got it. Got the right. <laughs> well, I hope you have a re- great rest of your packs. It's two more big days for all of us. But- yeah. We'll do it. We got this. Thanks for <laughs> Thank the man. Um, as well as some of the um people who are making tabletop accessories. Um, I talked to Glowcraft and I talked to um, some of the dice makers and all these different people who just bring really interesting perspectives on uh, the con as well, right? It's not just panels and getting to try stuff. And obviously we're only talking about the tabletop side of PAX. Um, I also did PAX XP, which is you've got to go around and you kind of ha- you kind of get to see the whole con doing it, um, but it's like there's little things you've got to scan all over the con and you get to see all these different elements of the video game side of it right the way through to looking at the board game um, sections, collaboratory, I am all the indie games. It's yeah, it's a really good way to see the con if you're if you're looking for a way um, to feel like you're doing something productive, but also getting to see a bit of everything. And sleeping? Yeah, mine's gonna be slightly different. Mine was probably the thing that I've spent the most amount of time on post packs. Um, I went to see a panel which was the Lit RPG panel and I had very little idea about what Lit RPG was going into the panel, but my kiddo wanted to go play D&D. They were going to be there for an hour and I was like, what's like very next door was this Lit RPG panel? I'm like, 
And the pitch was what happens if you combine books and RPGs or books and games? That was their pitch. And I'm like, that's my vibe. And I ended up sitting in there and I learned about this entire genre of fiction that I had no idea existed, which was, you know, generally like fantasy or sci-fi or post-apocalyptic fiction, which has an overlay of RPG to it so like often the main characters can see their stats and like often the worlds are constructed where the stats are visible to certain people um so yeah i've ended up spending like several hours reading lit rpgs after that particular panel which <laughs> i did not expect so so just, just to make sure i understand this correctly so it's not like when you know you read a book and it's like oh i'll stat what xyz character it's no they've made a, they've made a, a character and then like re- wrote a so, book about them So the fiction that I'm currently in, and I want you to think about it kind of in very much AO3 terms, like these people are like posting several times a week, different chapters. Um, The one that I'm currently most invested in is like an isekai fiction. So the main character has uh, died in the real world and they get transported to this fantasy land. And eventually after a while, they, they discover that they have access to like this HUD that pops up and they can see their stats so they can see like their strength and their endurance and um, their charisma and their luck stat and things like that. And so they have access to this and like people uh, in this world sort of like understand that this quote unquote system is kind of what kind of dictates their lives and dictates the world. They initially like they started as like a low level fetch adventurer, like going and like uh, just recovering, you know, different plants or like small animals and they come back and yeah so that 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 is an entire genre that I had no idea existed until the the Sunday of PAX and I have read uh, um, an embarrassing amount (laughs) of these this this fiction genre since PAX Um, I don't want to talk about it Oh, I, mean, I, I do, but you, like you, you might have opened up a rabbit hole for me. I feel like I'm going to do some research when we get off this recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh no, I don't have time for this, Stevie. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I wandered into a panel. I didn't know what I was walking into, <laughs> and now I'm going to make That's it everyone's problem. <laughs> That's just I've run into a panel I've and now I'm making it everyone else's what's problem. happened to me now. <laughs> 2025, yo. <laughs> oh my God. But like, but it's so true. I think the things we discover at PAX, the things we discover at PAX are so cool. Like I had some of the best conversations with people um, about their actual plays or their projects or their, um, like I am so keen to talk to Brandon from Raven's Ridge Emporium about Cartograph. Because I love that game. I love it so much. I didn't get to it, but like, yeah, I, I really am interested in Cartograph. They might have been in touch with us and we might uh, have a, might, might have to interview them in the upcoming weeks. We'll see. Uh, but no, I like spent vastly too much time uh, at their little booth and looking at all the pretty pretties. And I desperately want the glasses chains with dice on them and like copies of all the books. And yeah, I think that's the one thing that I will always say about events like PAX um, and lo- like Pixel Expo is the same, is you just get to talk to cool people who like the same stuff you like about the cool things they're doing and the cool things they know about. And it's so good. Like, it's so wholesome. Um, and we all get to, ha- like, nerd at each other and it's wonderful. And, like, Stevie and I, to be very clear, did not see each other all weekend <laughs> at all. I mean, you saw me, but <laughs> I did not see you. That's how big PAX is. Like, I was trying to... <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's like talk about what you guys did together. But when we started recording, you guys, oh no, we did nothing. <laughs> we didn't see Three other days, all. nothing. <laughs> well, no, CV saw my panel. I did not see. To be fair, the audience was rather large for Kate's panel because it was very popular. <gasps> oh no. <laughs> We're going to have like a whole bunch of links for this particular episode to all the oh, things so that we talked about. I, mean, I just want to say, from one of my previous years at PAX, I still got a very fond memory of playing Fragged Empire. And one of the other players had chosen the exact same character stat block as I had. And we decided off the cuff that we were twins. And just this kind of like weird little bond that we had for this game that we were siblings. And just running off into battle together was uh, still like a very happy RPG memory for mine. And I think it can only happen in packs or one of those kind of cons. Mm-hmm. 
there's just beautiful things that come out of convention gaming, I think. Yeah, was there anything else you guys want to bring, wanted to say about PAX or preparation even for next year's panels? Uh, there are already people discussing panels for next year. And uh, honestly, my general view for anyone who wants to pitch panels is like, don't think about it for another six months. Like, honestly, don't. Because stuff will change that you want to do. I have some thoughts about some cool panels that I think it would be great for us to do as a podcast for next year. But you know, that all depends on where we're all at next year. It's 12 months from now. Gosh, we we will never know where we will be in 12 months. And I think that's part of the beauty of, of PAX is it, is it reflects the environment that it is at the time that you are there. My, my thoughts are PAX regret is real and con regret is real. Like you cannot go and do and see everything that you want to see and your energy is limited. I did not play as many games as I wanted to. I did not see as many panels as I wanted to. I didn't, you know, go and try out as many games in the Indie Rising as I wanted to. And being okay with that, I think, is a big part of it. But also reflecting on, hey, if this is what I'm feeling, like, disappointment-wise post-packs, how can I improve that next time? Like, what strategies can I put in place to help me get the most out of future paxes or future cons and being realistic about those um those expectations too yeah being really realistic is really important i i'm a bit lucky i think that uh, my pax 2023 i was in a really clever move by kate uh doing a fringe show at melbourne fringe at the same time as pax weekend so i was splitting my energy between two very large events for me um and i learned at that pax that like it's okay to leave for an hour and go have a nap and go get some food and then come back. Like, that's fine. Yes, you won't get to do all the things. Like, did I want to play a bunch of games in tabletop this year? Yeah. Did I? No. Did I get to talk to a bunch of people who were running them so that I can maybe do that between the cons? Yeah. So, like, I want to play the <laughs> it's a game with goose sock puppets that Scarlet Song was running five times over the weekend. I think it was a blend of, like, Untitled Goose Game and Minutes to Midnight, I think. Anyway, it looked great and I wish I could have played it, but it didn't line up with anything I want to do. But uh, Scarlett and I will work out a time that we can play it digitally or in person or whatever. And I think a lot of those things where you just have to allow yourself to enjoy it the way that you can. Um, And also, in general, hydration is important. Good shoes are important. I bought new shoes for this pack. Oh, Stevie. (laughs) I bought a new pair of runners and it was the best gift to myself that I could have ever done. No regrets. I wore ankle boots all weekend and regret it firmly. So it's fine. But yeah, like just the self-care part is so important. And I think doubly so for those people who are doing Melbourne Games Week or South by Southwest or Pixel Expo two weeks before, there's so much on at the same time or as the a con. New Zealand Games Convention that's also happening at the same time as South by it's, Southwest. It's madness at the moment and it's just you have to look after yourself because you can't enjoy any of it if you burn a hole through yourself. And I think that, you know, some people are learning that lesson. I Seven panels was probably one panel too many, like honestly. Like I could probably have done two a day. The day I did three, I was absolutely exhausted. Luckily, the last thing I did was an actual play playing a kobold and it didn't matter that I was exhausted because we just did stupid chaos. And so that's fine. <laughs> like by that point, honestly, it, it Brain didn't cells matter. not required. Brain cells optional for this uh, actual play. Look, uh, I now regret it because um, the because that stuff is canon in the world and it's about to run into my other character who plays in that world. And I'm like, oh God, (laughs) what did I do? What did I do? But but I think that's the thing is like embrace the madness that is something like PAX and like say hi to the people you only get to see once or twice a year. Because they're all great too. Very true. Well, thank you so much, guys, for talking for talking packs this year. I um, sounds like you guys had an awesome time. Good times. We'll see you there next year, Dan. It'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be there. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Some people have been asking us what the best thing they can do is to support the podcast, and honestly, it's rating and reviewing it wherever you're listening to it. It really does help us reach brand new audiences and other listeners just like you. 
TTRPGs are for everybody and we want to reach as many people as possible. No matter where you're from, we want you to be part of the discussion, part of the roll call here at Aussie Roll Call. This podcast is produced in affiliation with the Australian roleplay community. If you'd like to join the ARC community, head to arcrpg.org where you'll find a link to our vibrant and inclusive Discord server. Your hosts have been Kate O'Sullivan, Dan Machuka and Stevie Schaefer. Cover art by Helen Graham of Joymon Studios. Title music is Sweet Sunday Groove by Slailkey. Interstitial music is Newer Wave by Kevin McLeod, used under a Creative Commons 4.0 license. Production by Stevie Schaefer.